best care to kids uh, right now. Like everyone, we've had to adapt and change as we respond to COVID-19, and we are taking efforts to share the ways we're doing that with you. Joining me today via Zoom is Dr. Frank Zhu, uh, our Medical Director of Infection Control and Prevention. Uh, Dr. Zhu has been a key member of the team here at Children's as we've continued to take necessary steps to provide kids with the best and safest possible care. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone watching that we'll be taking questions throughout this Facebook Live and uh, providing them to Dr. Zhu to answer at the end of the uh, chat. So if you have questions, please add them in the comments. Um, Dr. Zhu, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, given that your position might not be one as familiar to our audience, I was hoping you could give us a little background about yourself and what your responsibilities are here at Children's Wisconsin. Sure. Thanks, Vesta. I'm happy to uh, take time out and talk to you about that. So, so I am one of the pediatric infectious diseases physicians here at Children's. And my role as medical director of infection control and prevention is really leading our team of infection preventionists at Children's who typically manage and try to reduce uh, the likelihood of developing and transmission of infections throughout the hospital. Uh, so currently, I lead a team of three uh, IPs or infection preventionists who are all nurses and we work together with administration and as well as local leaders on, on each individual hospital unit to develop practices and recommendations to uh, prevent uh, the spread of infections within the hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, so at this point in time, everybody's heard about the concept of social distancing and it's part of our core response to COVID-19 at Children's as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the concept of social distancing and why it's so valuable and important? Right. So, so the entire concept of social distancing is to, to limit your interaction, close interactions with other people that may be carrying the disease. So, so the idea is that if you interact with less people and they are further away from you, so generally social distancing is, is bundled together with staying six feet apart from uh, other people, uh, it's unlikely for them to be able to transmit the virus from them to you and keep keep you safe from them. And also if you happen to carry the virus without any signs of infection, uh, it would be less likely for you to transmit it to other people unknowingly. So this applies both in the sort of public public and work worlds in outside of children's and also within children's itself where similarly to sort of staying at home, working at, from home and limiting interactions with other people, we've implemented similar policies at Children's to limit the amount of people actively working within the hospital at, at any time and also to limit interactions between both, both patients and staff members so that we are less likely to unknowingly transmit the virus within the hospital. Okay. Um, how about masks? For, for people watching that might not be aware, we've instituted a universal masking at Children's. Can you tell me a little more about that? Sure. So I think the, the whole idea of, of masks is there has been some mixed messaging uh, to the public initially about whether or not how effective they are and things like that. So the, the, whole, the whole concept of a, of a facial mask or a surgical mask or a cloth mask is that if you were to carry the virus itself and you were to cough or breathe it out, the mask can, can catch these sort of large respiratory droplets from either your mouth or your nose that could be carrying this virus and sort of trap it in your face so it's, it does not spread out to other people. And that way it is, it is quite effective. The second part of the mask preventing you from breathing in the virus or getting splashed on is a little bit more difficult in its effectiveness. There is definitely some effectiveness in, you know, if you, someone were to cough onto you, if you had the mask to catch those droplets, it is certainly less less likely to for you to breathe in the virus and get uh, get COVID. But at the same at the same time, these masks are not respirators or they don't have full seals and things like that. So wearing the mask itself, you still can breathe in around the mask. So it, it does not prevent you from breathing in all filter in all viruses that you are you know sort of breathing in at this at the same time. So so the, so the idea of universal masking really is to prevent transmission within the hospital 
that may be occurring because people can have very mild or no symptoms, no symptoms with COVID. Okay, so we're both having our staff wear medical grade masks, but then we're also asking families to bring, uh, to wear masks when they visit any of our locations. Uh, if they have their own cloth masks, that's totally fine. Um, otherwise we'll provide families and, and patients with masks when they come in. Um, can you tell me a little more about some other steps that we've taken here in response to COVID-19 and what those might be? Sure, I mean, we, we, have, we have implemented a, a large, large number of procedures to try to prevent the transmission of COVID within the hospital. So if we go in from, you know, from your first steps of entering the hospital, you'll, you'll note that there, there are now temperatures, temperature and symptom screenings at, at all entrances for both employees and patients and their families. The idea is that certainly we don't want you to work when you're sick. And and even if you have minor symptoms or you don't feel ill, you could still have you could have a low grade fever. You could have some coughs that you know you don't really think about. And in those cases, we would want to we would want to um, catch that and send you home um, to prevent transmission within the hospital. Obviously, if your child is sick, we will still allow him or her inside the hospital to be treated for their to be treated for their illness. Um, these screening stations also have little marks so that you can stay six feet apart and and you know practice good social distancing. As you enter the hospital, you'll note that, like we noted earlier, everyone is wearing masks to help help prevent transmission of COVID. We've shut down public public gathering areas, which could pose a challenge to social distancing, like the cafeteria and other gathering areas, the, the gift shop and things like that, so that people are not lingering together and possibly transmitting when possible. And, and, and you will also note that the number of staff in the hospital has been reduced to basically essential personnel for taking care of patients. And this is also to reduce the likelihood of spread between providers to each other, to patients, to parents. Uh, and then you will note that we do have new requirements for personal protective equipment or PPE that I'm sure people have been seeing a lot on, a lot on the a lot on the news. So patients with respiratory symptoms concerning with COVID that could sort of spread it throughout the hospital, uh, we are putting them in what we call negative pressure. So negative pressure is that ra rather when you go into the room, uh, there will be basically a suction that keeps air sucking into the room and then pump out of the hospital instead of allowing it to circulate normally in the room and also outside in the hallway. So if there's any virus from patients in that room, it doesn't leave that room. Instead, it gets, it gets filtered and filtered and pumped out of the, uh, the hospital uh, in a safe way to pre also prevent transmission. Also, there's a lot of guidance on um, you know, wearing gowns for these patients to, to, to prevent transmission throughout um, on what we call fomites, which is basically particles with virus that can sort of stick to different parts, uh, different parts of the body. Uh, we've enhanced our cleaning tech, cleaning techniques, and as we stated earlier, um, all staff will have different grades of masks de depending on um, depending on the likelihood of exposure to COVID. And a lot of them will have what we call the N95 respirators or capper units, which are respirators that prevent you from breathing in of uh, the virus through the normal air. Okay. Um, so in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we here at Children's followed CDC guidelines delaying elective procedures and non-emergency treatment. Uh, but that's starting to kind of evolve and change. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what we're beginning to do now as far as elective procedures and non-emergent treatment and things like that? Right, so I think we need to emphasize that during the initial stages of the pandemic, the CDC guidance to delay elective procedures and non-emergency treatment was entirely reasonable. We, do not, we did not want to overwhelm the healthcare system. Uh, with a lot of a huge spike in infections that could certainly compromise patient patient care and outcomes. As we've sort of gone it through the months of the COVID pandemic now, uh, it's clear that we are still having a good amount of community transmission that has, has, has stabilized, although we, we will continue to see spikes here and there. Uh, but we need to, at the same time, look at 
the procedures that we are delaying, that even though they are elective, are also still medically necessary. And the, the longer we delay them, um, we could be sacrificing these patients' medical health by and ha having the, and compromising their care a little bit if we continue to delay them without and not perform them. So in that way, we've we just we reached the point where we think that the infection is stable enough that we can we can start to slowly reopen some services that are while not emergent are still medically necessary. So, but we want to do this as as safe as possible. So this means that we have to make we we're, we're making sure that we're not doing too much so that we have enough personal protective equipment as as dis discussed earlier, and we're also continue to increase our testing cap capabilities because. A lot of these procedures require people to mess around with the airways to, you know, to sedate patients and things like that. And that is considered a high risk procedure because the virus, if it's in your throat or your lungs, if you cough when people are messing with the airway, you can spread the virus in the air. So, so we are testing all of our patients before we do these procedures now. And you have to have a negative test before we will do these procedures on you. And we also are working to sort of Work with the health department, other lab labs to increase our uh, testing capabilities. Okay. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on um, in the event that a child with COVID-19 is admitted to our hospital, um, what are the different things we're doing to keep them and other patients safe, but along with our staff as well? Right. So like many, like many other hospitals, uh, we we have designated uh, special areas of the hospital to be isolation for suspected and confirmed COVID positive patients, and in these areas, like we've touched about, one they're all negative pressure, so that so that there is no air from those rooms that going out in the hallways and possibly contaminating other people, and and the, the air will be filtered and then pumped out pumped out of the hospital. All providers who are taking care of uh, COVID patients uh, uh, who are known COVID positive wear what we call capper units, which are kind of those sort of spacesuit looking like uh, breathing units where they have the face shield and the mask around it and it, it filters and it kind of filters the air out uh, in a way that uh, does not allow any you to breathe in any virus particles. It's similar to an N95, but sort of covered, it's like a helmet that you kind of put over your entire face. And then uh, if they are COVID positive, uh, uh, so healthcare workers are also wearing um, full body gowns uh, to sort of prevent the transmission of, of uh, COVID on fomites on the surface. Of, on the surface. Finally, these rooms are cleaned uh, rigorously by uh, environmental services and we we limit the we limit the access of um to these patients to only the providers that are absolutely necessary to provide care for them the nurse that's there necessary to provide care for them and you know currently we allow you know one parent or guardian with them okay um can you tell me a little bit about uh what we know about how COVID-19 affects kids I know there's a lot of information out there and um, what's kind of our perspective on that? Right, so so how COVID-19 affects kids, I think the best, the, the best thing we can say is we're always learning more about COVID-19 and especially with pediatrics, uh, we don't, the amount of data that's available in pediatrics is significantly less compared to adult data simply because there's not an, as many pediatric patients. What we can say is that by all reports, um, COVID-19 is far milder in pediatrics than, the, than it is in adults. Most kids have very mild or no symptoms, although certainly there are kids with severe symptoms as well. But the, but the number of kids and the percentage of kids that have developed severe disease compared to adults is astronomically lower, and the number of kids who test positive that require hospital, hospitalization compared to adults is also is also lower. Uh, the reason for this, you know, we will have to let the science sort of sort of play out. It's currently it remains unclear, but but what I can tell you now is that we have tested many children in the hospital 
uh, in terms of for COVID-19 and the percentages that we have that are positive are much lower than say compare, comparing it to adult, like our adult hospital further, which is you know just across the street. So we don't know for sure if there are if there are truly less infected children than adults or children are just so asymptomatic that no, they don't have no symptoms, they're not getting tested. But it seems like to us that the number of children who carry the virus seems to be significantly less and those who do carry the virus are less ill. Okay. Um, as this is evolving and changing, um, what, did, what do you find most concerning about COVID-19? I think the most concerning thing about COVID-19 is how little we know about it. Uh, but uh, in terms of in terms of what we are what to fear sort of and to keep in mind going forward is that is that you know as we as we increase our access and increase our access as safely as possible to provide essential services, uh, we have to be cognizant that that essential services will be provided both in the hospital and outside in the community as you know states will invariably at some point start to open up some of their services as the as the numbers sort of stabilize. So we need to be careful that this will not cause what people are concerned talking about the second wave or second spike uh, of infections in that the more the less social distancing we do as we open up, there is always the risk that there is going to be more infection. And we need to be careful, uh, careful and remain on guard just because that we've, you know, lived through you know, two months of quarantine and COVID that we, we know how it's gonna play out. Things can change very quickly as we change our how we behave and we need to watch closely and be cognizant of that. Okay, uh, thank you. Is there anything else that you want to know or want families to know about how we're responding to COVID-19 and to be aware of with Children's Wisconsin? You know, I think you know, I think the most important thing that we need to, we want to push out is that, you know, it's it's very important to be safe, exercise good social distancing, good hand hygiene, prevent transmission, wear your mask, prevent transmission of COVID as much as possible. But at the same time, you know, we, uh, we also need to start providing the essential services to our patients to make sure that their other health needs are being met. That includes, you know, getting, Getting, vaccin getting vaccinated, uh, the expansion of medically necessary but not emergent procedures that we had discussed discussed about uh, earlier, and also you know any other illnesses that you know you would you are concerned about, you should still continue to reach out to your physician, your primary care physician, and have a good discussion about that. You know whether this is a televisit or an in person visit, and not to neglect not to ne neglect and medical care because of trying to practice too much social distancing social distancing because it is a balance of both and we 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 strive to provide you know what we always say the best and safest care and a the safest environment possible to provide medical care for for all of our patients so do not do not you know disregard or put off medical treatment uh, for the pandemic we will work with you uh, as closely as possible to provide you safe care and also non-COVID care, even though, you know, people, it's hard to think about anything other than COVID these days. Okay. Um, do we, we have a question or two from online that'll be read to you here. Sure. Are asthmatic children, especially those with viral-induced asthma, at a higher risk to have more severe symptoms if they contract COVID-19? Uh, the answer to that is, it is, it is not yet clear whether or not asthmatics have higher risk for severe symptoms. Most, most uh, sort of study of children sort of group people with chronic, what they call chronic pulmonary disease or chronic lung disease, of which asthma is one of them. But as you, asthma has a very wide range of presentations for people with very severe asthma uh, who are on sort of, you know, daily medications to people with very mild asthma that may just need their inhaler when they, you know, exercise very stringently. Uh, so, so we don't know for sure, but our perspective is that we believe that since if you do have asthma, 
we do believe that you are most likely at some degree of higher risk. But we do not know is what degree of higher risk that, that is, and that may be related to how severe your asthma is. It may not be related. There's just really not enough data to know for sure at this time. OK. That was the only question we had. So thank you so much, Dr. Zhu. We really appreciate you taking the time today. Um, as he mentioned, if you have any questions about Children's Wisconsin or COVID-19, um, please reach out to your primary care doctor or you can visit our website, chw.org coronavirus, which will be in the description for this video. Uh, there you can find all kinds of resources from details about our locations and hours to blogs about how to talk to your kids about COVID-19. Um, and please remember if your child does need medical attention, we are here. Uh, we're taking every precaution to ensure the safety of your family and our staff uh, as we continue to pr provide necessary in-person care. Um, our emergency room is open 24-7, as is many of our urgent care locations remain open some nights and weekends. Um, please join us next week, Tuesday, for another live stream, this time with a team member from our mental and behavior health team. And again, thank you so much for watching, and thank you again so much, Dr. Zhu. You're welcome. Uh, always happy to help. Thank you.